What's up everyone? If you don't know me, I'm Zo. I'm a foundation dentist working here in London and in this video I'm going to cover how you can interpret and understand radiographs and I'll also give you the best order for you to report and present them to your supervisor or anyone else so you don't get roasted on clinic like I used to. So this video will be split into two parts. In the first part, I'll cover interpreting bite wings and periapicals. And in the second part, I'll cover a systematic way to present the radiographs to make sure you don't miss anything out. And I've also made a little acronym to help with that. Now, all the information like the images and radiographs in this video are from this book called The Essentials of Dental Radiography and Radiology by Eric Waits. So if you guys wanna learn about this stuff in even more depth, then check out the book and I'll put a link in the description and I'll also put timestamps down below and in the comments, so feel free to skip around. So let's start with bite wings. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with how x-rays are taken or how they work. I'll let your uni bore you with that, but let's talk about why we take bite wings in the first place. Well, the main indications are to detect caries, monitor the progression of caries, and to assess any existing restoration. So for example, overhangs on amalgams or secondary caries. Now, some would say you can actually use bite wings to assess bone levels, and to a certain extent you can, but according to the guidelines, you won't be able to form a proper periodontal diagnosis from it. And that's because you can't see the full length of the root to be able to say what percent of bone loss there is. So for example, let's say you look at this radiograph here. This is all you would basically see from a bite wing. You might think that it looks like 40 to 50% bone loss, but if you had a full PA, like this one here, you can see the tooth actually has very long roots. So it's more like 30% bone loss. So this might be the difference between diagnosing them with stage three or stage two. But at the end of the day, does that really matter? You're still going to do the same period treatment, but the difference is you just called it something else. So is it worth taking the periapical? That's what you need to decide for yourself as a dentist and it's out of my scope to tell you. But anyways, let's move on to something I can tell you, which is how often you should take bite wings. Well, the SGDP conveniently has a set of guidelines called Selection Criteria for Dental Radiography. And this is what they advise. So pause the screen if you wanna have a look. And I'll put a link in the description for the online version if you wanna have a look. But the basic gist is the higher the risk, the shorter the interval. And keep in mind, you should keep repeating the bite wings until no new or active lesions are apparent and the individual has entered another risk category. So now let's start analyzing a bite wing. An ideal bite wing should start from the mesial of the upper first molar and extend as far as the distal of the upper second molar, as you can see here. But of course that won't always be the case. So what can you see? So of course you can see the upper and lower teeth. And on some of the teeth, you can see the distinct layers between the enamel, the dentine and, and the pulp as well. And you can see the bone levels there and any restorations that they might have. So the order weight suggests to look at bite wings is to start in the corner. So for the right side, it would be the distal aspect of the last standing tooth and you work your way to the canine, analyzing each tooth. It will be the distal aspect of this canine here. Then you work your way down to the distal aspect of the lower canine, and you go through each tooth to you get to the last standing tooth of the, of the lower arch. And this way, you don't just kind of glance over the whole radiograph and miss anything. And to analyze each tooth, weights has a 10 step approach, but I've narrowed it down to just five. But keep in mind, as you practice and you see more and more radiographs, this will become much faster and you kind of learn the things to look out for. So the first step is to trace the outline of the enamel and the EDJ and note any alterations in shape which might be like a possible cavitation. So just trace the edges and see if you notice anything and what you're looking for are radiolucencies. On this radiograph there's not much but if you zoom in you notice tiny enamel lesions which you might have missed if you didn't bother to trace the whole enamel cap. And one thing to remember as well is that caries are usually larger clinically than they appear on the radiograph and the number that gets thrown around is about 20 to 25 percent worse clinically than what it looks like on the radiograph itself. So next you want to check the interproximal for radiolucent triangular shadows caused by caries but you want to watch out for mistaking cervical burnout for caries. Cervical burnout is this radiolucency you often see at the cervical margin of the teeth and it's actually an artifact made by the anatomy of the teeth. Simply put in the cervical region there's less tissues for the x-ray beam to pass through and so it appears radiolucent. So this diagram on the left is showing what it kind of looks like on a radiograph and on the right you can see some really obvious ones there and they don't always look this big and obvious but sometimes they can look as small as even this one right here. But there are some features you can look out for to distinguish between caries and cervical burnout. So firstly, it's always at the neck of the teeth and it's demarcated between the enamel cap 
and the alveolar bone. So for example, you can tell this one is caries and not cervical burnout because it goes above and under the enamel cap, whereas cervical burnout wouldn't do that. And they're also triangular in shape and they gradually become less radiolucent. And you can see that right here on this one. But keep in mind, you don't want to just diagnose them from radiograph. So always look back into the mouth as well to confirm if it's caries or not. So moving on, number one, you check the enamel and traced it. Number two, you check the interproximal caries and checked for cervical burnout. Now third is to check for root caries and denting caries like cervical and occlusal caries. So in this one you can see the root caries on the lower right 7 and the upper right 5 here. And on this one you can just about see some of the occlusal caries but if you adjust the contrast you can see that so much better. And this is why digital x-rays are so much better because if you just mess around with the contrast you can actually see so much more. So fourth is to check for existing restorations and you want to check to see if they're over contoured, under contoured. Uh, how they adapt to the adjacent tooth, like the contact points, look for ledges, overhangs, secondary caries, and marginal fits of restorations like crowns. So I'll go through some examples with you guys. And so for example, on this one, you can see the massive overhang on this amalgam. And these can be quite common and you really wanna make sure that you treat this because it can be a massive plaque trap for your patients. And there's a lot going on in these radiographs. You can see ledges, you, know, you can see overhangs, and you can see how poorly contoured some of these uh, amalgams are. And on this one, I just wanted to show the marginal fit of this crown here, and you can see the ledge right there. So the fifth and final thing to check is the pulp. You wanna check the size of the pulp chamber and maybe see pulp stones that might affect any endo treatment. You can see some on the back molars here. Seeing pulp stones like this might potentially give you an explanation as to why the tooth is not responding to sensibility testing. And also patients who are bruxes tend to have pulp stones like this one. So that's how you can analyze a bite wing. And to summarize, the things to note are bone levels, caries, secondary caries, cervical burnout, overhanging restorations, ledges, and pop stones. Okay, so let's move on to periapicals. And there's loads of reasons as to why you might want to take a PA. Some of the main ones are detecting apical pathologies, assessing bone levels for perio, after trauma, like a fractured tooth, assessing root morphology before an extraction, for root canal treatment, and evaluation of heavily restored teeth or implants. Okay, so let's look at one. So this is a PA of the upper left four, five, six, seven. And as you can see, the main difference between a bite wing and a PA is that in the PA, as the name suggests, you get a good view of the periapical tissues. And all the things I mentioned that you can assess in the bite wing, you can assess in the PA as well. But keep in mind, PAs are not as good as bite wings for detecting caries. So if you want to detect caries, especially interproximal caries, you want to take a bite wing and then if needed, supplement it with a PA. But PAs are great for periapical tissues. And when you're assessing the periapical tissues, there are three important features you need to look at the periodontal ligament space, the laminate dura, and the surrounding bone. So let's look at this PA. The PDL space is this dark radiolucent line that outlines the root of the tooth and all the ligaments that hold the tooth are in place there. The laminate dura is the continuous radio opaque line just next to the PDL and again surrounds the root of the tooth. The laminate dura is actually just compact bone in the tooth socket and it's where the periodontal ligaments attach to. These three things are key in analysing the periapical tissues because any changes to their thickness, continuity or radio density can be an indication of disease. In our video on diagnosis, we talked about how after pop necrosis, you can get an acute or chronic inflammatory response. Check out that video if you haven't already. At the start, inflammatory exudate accumulates in the PDL space and can cause what we call PDL widening, as you can see on this radiograph here. Now, if it was only PDL widening that you saw on the radiograph, then you might think it's in the earlier stages of acute apical periodontitis. But as the infection spreads, you start to get resorption of the bony socket and you will see loss of laminate dura as well. And you can see the loss of laminate dura here on this upper left one. Now, this is more likely to be in the early stages of acute apical abscess, but as the abscess grows, it can form an even larger radiolucency like the one you can see on the upper left two here. So here you can see all the three features that we talked about. You've got PDL widening, you've got loss of laminar dura, and you have bone resorption. Now, a tooth like this will most likely need root canal treatment if you want to save it or an extraction. And those two are a big reason as to why you might want to take a PA as well. For example, if you plan to do a root canal treatment on this tooth, you would assess the canals and the roots. For example, if it's a molar tooth, you'd want to know how many roots does it have, is it curved? But on this one, you can notice something that's even more important, which is that they have a rare developmental anomaly called densin dente, which is like an infolding of enamel into dentine. So straight away, you know this is a specialist job. Another thing with PAs is that you can also estimate the length of the canals. So you can get an estimate of the working length, like on this tooth here. And you can also measure the distance to the pulp digitally as well. So you can know how deep to drill when making your access cavity. And if you have a physical radiograph, you can just hold up your burr against the radiograph and you'll see the length of the burr compared to how deep your access cavity needs to be. Now, if you want to extract a tooth like this, upper left six, for example, 
So when you're looking at a PA, there's a few things you want to know. Firstly, how many roots are there? And on this one, you can see three. Uh, are they curved? This one, you can see they're kind of slightly distally curved and you want to know any major structure. So for example, in this one, it's the maxillary sinus and you can trace the outline of it right there. So you know there's a risk of an OAC with an extraction like this one. You also want to note the density of the bone and how much coronal tooth structure is left as well. If you put forceps on this, will this crumble? And you also want to look for radiolucencies in the fication, which might make it easier for you to grip the tooth with forceps. Okay, so that was it for PAs as well. Now let's move on to the second part of the video, which is reporting on the radiographs, which will also help you with presenting them as well. A few things to know when reporting or presenting in terms of terminology. We take x-rays to produce radiographs. So when you're presenting on clinic, make sure you use the right words. You present a radiograph, so don't call it an x-ray because some supervisor might actually call you up on that. And also, keep in mind, radiographs can give us clues as to what might be happening clinically. So for example, on this bite wing, you can see a massive radiolucency. And I know it looks like caries, but when presenting, you can't say distal occlusal caries on lower left six because it could be a lost filling or something you don't know. So the phrase you have to use to be correct is distal occlusal radiolucency on lower left six indicative of caries. Okay, so now we've got the terminology out of the way, let's move on to what you should actually write in your radiographic report in your notes. So the first thing you want to mention is what type of radiograph is it? Is it a PA? Is it a bite wing? Is it a DPT? Then you want to mention the location. So if it's a bite wing, is it a left bite wing? Is it a right bite wing? Is it a PA of uh, an upper right five? And then you also want to give it a grade. So from the FGDP guidelines, you know, grade one is excellent. So there was no errors or anything. Grade two is diagnostically acceptable. So there might be some cone cut or something like that and grade three is unacceptable where you're gonna to have to redo that one. And next you wanna write your actual report and this is where I've made the acronym CREPS. So the first part of the CREPS acronym is C, which is caries. And you wanna note the site and depth of any radiolucencies which are indicative of caries. Next is R, which is restorative. You wanna mention any deep fillings, any crowns, bridges, implants, failing restorations, open margins, overhangs, literally anything to do with restorative. E is the endodontics. So do they have a root filling? What's the quality of it? Is it well condensed? Is it to length? You wanna mention the roots or the canal shapes, any root resorption, any root fractures. So again, anything to do with endodontics. P is for periapical. And this is where there are three things that we mentioned before, the PDL, the lamina dura, and the bone resorption. And S is for structures. And so this is where you mentioned the bone levels, any structures like the maxillary sinus or the mental nerve or the ID nerve, or any pathologies that you notice in the bone. And so to recap, CREPS, C is for caries, R is for restorative, E is for endodontics, P is for periapical, and S is for structures. And you can kind of have this on the back of your head as you're presenting, or when you're writing your radiographic report, just so you don't miss anything out. All right guys, that was it for this video. I hope you found that useful. And if you did, I'd appreciate it if you gave us a like and subscribed. You might also enjoy some of the other videos we have on this channel. So why don't you check out some of the suggestions here? Let us know in the comments below if you have any acronyms that you like to use. I have a quite a funny one for partial denture design. So if you guys want to see a video on that, let me know. All right guys, see you in the next video.